Hi, I'm Dr. Frank Anthony Thomas, and it is another opportunity to present one of the gifted voices that are of the preaching guild in America. We have Charles Edward Goodman Jr. here for an interview. We are live. It's going to be a great time. I'm excited, man. I'm just so glad you decided to come, and thank you so much. We just honor you and honor your preaching and that you know, you're a significant voice and you've thought a lot about preaching and so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. It's an honor and a privilege uh, to just be amongst so many great proclaimers, women and, and men who uh, have this great call, who in your words are adding to the sacred tradition of African-American preaching. Well, thank you, thank you. I think I wanna start with your name, um, Charles Edward Goodman Jr striking memory of Charles Edward Booth. So I don't know, you all had a relationship. Give me, just say a little bit about it so that we honor him again. Yeah, rest in power, Dr. Booth. He was a preaching exemplar for me, mm -hmm. uh, one of God's best, and uh, someone who admired from afar and was graced to uh, eventually develop a relationship with him. He did my first revival, him and my best friend, Dr. Philip Porter, at Tabernacle when I came in 2007. So to spend that extended time with him then, and then we would just see one another. So it was always funny when he heard my full name, Charles Edward Goodman. <laughs> he said, nephew, you are my namesake. So uh, I carried that. And uh, even when he passed, I was like, well, there's no way I can put on his shoes, but let's see if I can carry the torch. So I, um, I, I wear that with pride. So uh, rest in power, Dr. Booth, he's, you know, I, I'll be that second Charles Edward and, uh, and we'll, we'll push on it. So right off the bat, I, can, I get a sense that legacy and preachers who have come before you are important to yeah. you. So say a little bit about that, both some who came before you mm -hmm and why they are so important to you. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, my, my foray into preaching kind of is, has an interesting, I was, I was raised United Holy Church. Mm. So I was adopted at 14 months by my maternal grandparents. Okay. And uh, it's so interesting. Um, when I think about the first preacher that impacted me was my grandmother. Mm. But she was, she was raised in a time where they were not validating women in ministry right. to that degree. So she got her missionary license. Mm -hmm. um, but I would go and look throughout our house and she would have sermons tucked in Bibles, mm -hmm. in books. Mm -hmm. She used to ghost write for the bishops, which is the interesting <laughs> thing. Uh, I, I need to find some of that stuff and, and do something with it. Um, and so early on, just this, having her, my grandfather, every night reading, they would play sermons all day. I grew up in a household where I'm gonna hear G.E. Patterson mm -hmm. on the TV, I'm gonna hear it's so crazy, Fred Price, or whoever was the, on TV, whether it's CBN, TBN, I'm gonna hear them. And then going around, listening to the preachers that I grew up down the street, um, Bishop Fields, who was around the corner at um, Hayes Memorial United Holy Church. But then there was some great local legends like uh, Dr. Cartis Brown in New Light, or uh, Dr. William Wright at New Zion, or Dr. George Brooks at Mount Zion, who are in Greensboro, who may not have the national claim, but man, for me as a kid, I would hear them. Every year, Dr. Carter Brown would bring in Dr. Wesley McLaughlin from Petersburg. So he would take me to the revival. So there was something early on about preaching that I started to listen and it just resonated with me. One of the most critical things that brought me greater exposure is when I moved to DC, my best friend got, excuse me, so bad, I want you to stay there, but okay. you know, take, so th this is Greensboro, North Carolina? Yes, Greensboro, North right. Carolina. Right, so that's set, I'm just trying to set the scene okay. for the audience. They okay. may not know Greensboro, okay. North okay. Carolina. Okay. So, you know, there you were, just set the scene there a little bit. Okay. That's where you were, you were yeah, born. Raised, raised. Raised. I was raised uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. So that really was kind of the crucible of my exposure. Okay. But then that was a time before social media, you know, so we were still getting cassette tapes, right. you know. Um, and so from that, one of the most pivotal things that really brought in my exposure, Dr. Thomas, was when I went with my best friend, he got drafted by the Washington Wizards, and I find myself in Washington, D.C., and I got connected to uh, Pastor Anthony Macklin mm -hmm. at Glendale Baptist Church, now it's a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And man, when I went there, because of his national exposure, I began to raid their bookstore. Mm -hmm. And I was hearing voices that I had never heard before because they weren't on the local TV where I was. How old were you here? I was 21. 21, 22 years old. Okay. Uh, so then I'm getting to hear a Maurice Watson, mm -hmm. a Ralph West, uh, Lance Watson, 
yourself. I'm hearing, so then once I got it, I started being a connoisseur of all these tapes and then it became, I just want to hear all these preachers, Bishop Walter Scott Thomas, Dr. Charles Booth, mm -hmm. Evie, I mean, things that I was getting ready to be exposed to and it just created this hunger in me because as much as I was growing up Pentecostal, it was something about the structure of the Baptist sermonic presentation mm -hmm. that really appealed to not just my heart, but to my mind. And so I just really began to just study it, study it, study it, and study it. And that's what kind of really pushed me that way. So let me push you on, push you on that a little bit. So, and of course, we, we don't do um, derogatory, mm -hmm. but I want you to compare mm -hmm. the Pentecostal homiletic structure mm -hmm. and the Baptist homiletic. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not we're not comparing yeah, saying better than is this different more passion oriented I mean for me my exposure was I mean there was a real belief in what you said mm -hmm. but it was more of a kind of a topical expression mm -hmm. if I was to say that yeah. um, similar themes um, the Baptist to me had a more rigid approach to textual mm -hmm. one text focused preaching okay, okay. so um, both of them were very valid. They, they both um, kind of really built me spiritually. I think the Pentecostal movement was a lot of different scriptures, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whereas the Baptists seem to have this focus on one text, right. uh, expository, right. and we're going to unpack this passage as much as possible. And that really just spoke to me because I think there was more histrionics to it, uh, more background to it. So it, just, it was just different. I, it was just different. And so my aim, and so it's crazy to bring that up, is to kind of marry both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have the structure from one particular uh, idea, but then bring that passion right. and that real um, um, belief in what you are saying. Not saying that either one does it, but just to try to add them both. So if I was to be, I'm a mutt when it comes to it. I want to be a Bapticostal and right. whatever that looks like. Yeah. Right, right, right. So tell me now some about, you know, education, because you have a lot of it. So tell me, tell me <laughs> yeah, about that. Much. <laughs> I know it's interesting. My educational pursuit started really because I was told when I was a kid that I wasn't smart enough. Mm. You know, as, as many of the stories of many of our black children, uh, they tried to label me and wanted to put me in different classes. And I'll never forget my grandmother came up to school and said, that boy is not dumb. Mm -hmm. He just needs to be challenged more. And they refused to put me in where they wanted to. I'm grateful for my grandparents. And so they made me do extra work. So there's always been this thing for me that I just believe that education was the key. They always instilled in me, get the education. Um, so from there, from, from growing up in Greensboro, uh, my grandparents had this thing, you couldn't go to school in Greensboro. So I had to go somewhere else. So I was fortunate enough to get a full academic ride to Wake Forest University. Um, I was also able to play basketball there. But what was interesting, what also grew my love for language there is I had the opportunity to be the student ambassador for Dr. Maya Angelou. So uh, that was a wonderful opportunity to sit at her feet who in her own way as a griot, you know, she's a preacher, <laughs> you know, I mean, she and very spiritual in what she did. So from Wake Forest, uh, it was uh, during my senior year, I had a diagnosis of ALS, and I know we'll probably get to that. Uh, that kind of really turned my trajectory because I assumed I was going to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I was going to preach on the side. I, I, I had this call since I was eight years old, um, but I didn't see ministry as a, as a profession. Right. You, know, that, you know, I kind of grew up in a way where pe pastors had a second job. I, didn't, I, I thought I'd be a lawyer and then preach on the side. And so that, that was a formative thing, taking that year off and then get an opportunity to one of my mentors, Dr. Brad Braxton, mm -hmm. who just came to Wake Forest. My senior year was his first year. Wow. Wow. And meeting him and expressing what I wanted to do. And he said, I think a great school for you would be Emory Candler School of Theology. That's where he got his PhD. So that begins that odyssey going to Emory Candler School of Theology. While I'm there after the first year, I get my first pastorate. So I start pastoring during my first sojourn at um, at Emory Callen School of Theology. I know we'll come back and discuss that. And so I finished that, my MD of there, Wesley Theological Seminary at the time. So tell me, so ages, you know, okay, so yes. you're 21. Yes, give, 21 give, yes. Yeah, so how, so how it's, give me. I, I graduate um, from college at 21. Okay. Take year off. I start seminary at 22. Okay. Um, get my first pastor at 23. By 25, I graduate with my Master's of Divinity from Callen School of Theology. Okay. 26, I'm starting my doctoral work at Wesley Theological Seminary uh, um, under Bill McLean. So this is D-Men? D-Men, yeah. D-Men, okay. my, first, my first doctor. So D-Men. Uh, and they had a thing where they allowed you to um, erase the three-year wait. Mm 
because I was already pastoring. Right. So I get to go there, come back to DC. I love DC. So I'm getting that. I graduated at 29 with my D men um, and things are just happening so fast. By that time, a couple years after that, I go into Cambridge College to get a master's of management, executive MBA. Um, I do some work at Yale. Um, I do executive coaching degree at Howard Business School and then just recently finished a PhD at Anderson University uh, in Anderson, South Carolina in leadership. So that's a lot of education. It's a lot. <laughs> I'm trying to catch up with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you had a PhD and a DB and I'm trying to be right. where you are. I, I stretched my, I was 57, but I was like, no, I was 48 or something when I got a PhD. You, you, you've compacted it. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna go back a minute. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back a minute. I would imagine that being that close to Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. that poetry had to slip into your preaching. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I, is there a connection there? It did, you know what's interesting I kind of grew up in a time too, too, also where social media was changing. The language was beginning to shift. Okay. Because I am also a product of hip hop. Okay. Tell me about it. Right. Cool. So hip hop is is the language that I grew up with. Right. You know the witty wordplay. Um, so it's not as the long flowery. Why does the cage bird sing? It's more like Jay Z, Biggie, Tupac in my mind. Right. So I'm having to merge these kind of creative nature with what we're putting together. Um, so I would say that it is playing, but it's at a faster pace. Mm -hmm. It is. You know, it's moving. Hip hop has a different cadence. Right. And so I think that becomes entwined in preaching because I will say, we talked about earlier, some of the older kind of preachers that I was, uh, that I was kind of enamored with had the slower cadence. Mm -hmm. You could tell that generation. And right. build. You know, and build, right? It's the yeah. runway. But mine is the quick, witty, multi-climatic movement. So I think I'm, I'm kind of being formed and shaped in that kind of, of, of listening pattern, but also speaking pattern. See, our interview is, in, is unfolding in your style. Mm. Our interview is folding, unfolding yeah. quickly. You know, so it, it, uh, I'm noticing that, you know, when some interviews, they old school me and old school preacher, we kind of build, you know, but boom, you come out the boom, 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 we, you know, we got this piece. And I want to go back and ask you about, okay, so let, tell me about what did you do your PhD in? Mm -hmm. You said leadership. Mm -hmm. Does that connect with preaching at all anyway? It did, yes, yeah. because it was leadership in crisis. I, I really got it done during the COVID pandemic. So part of it was as a black preacher, black pastor, our role is leadership through the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just the, the conference room is what we're saying to people and how we're conveying it. And the truth of the matter is, a lot of our leadership during COVID was through the media and the preaching because that's all we had. Right. We weren't gathering, we weren't together. So that was really, I have this thing, and this is my own ethic as far as what it means. Preaching grows people, leadership grows churches, right? Mm -hmm. Like they have to be married. And so I'm always trying to figure out ways in the sermonic moment, in the presentation time, how am I conveying vision, not only am I also offering hope, but also trajectory and progression, what we're trying to accomplish, what we want to do. Um, so I see them intricately and tied. So that was why that leadership piece really, really engaged me. So talk to me a minute about the, your pastoral journey. We talked a little about the educational journey. Mm -hmm. So give me, give, me your, give me your pastoral journey and, and the fabulous work you've done in pastoring. Mm -hmm. Well, my first church is so interesting. I got, so I was at seminary at Emory County School of Theology and I was in, we had what is called Con Ed, contextual education. So we had to go to the women's state prison uh, in Georgia. Matter of fact, interesting story for me is the only woman on, on death row at the time, it was my responsibility weekly to go provide communion. Mm -hmm. So I would go and then chaplain, bishop, and my, and my uh, advisor at the time, the famed um, Luke, Luke, uh, Luke Timothy Johnson, mm -hmm. Uh, would take us, and so they needed preachers on Sunday evening. No one wanted to go to the prison, but I'm like, man, it's an opportunity to preach. I want to go. <laughs> it ain't no church like prison church. <laughs> I mean, for weeks, I was just going and working on the craft. I was just like, that is dope. I get to preach. I, I went, you know, I'm a young preacher. I didn't know anybody in Atlanta, so it was an opportunity mm -hmm. to get to home. Right. So in our Con Ed class, a woman by the name of Annie Boyd. I haven't seen her since. I hope she catches this and, and, and sends something. But she said she went to her nephew's church in Alabama and she did a nutrition conference for him that was held at a church that was vacant. Mm. She came to class the next day, she said, 
good man, I don't know. The Lord just told me, I think this would be a good opportunity for you. Here's the number that they told me to one of the deacons, give him a call. Mm. Well, it's a country place. Mm. So really the number she gave me was the wrong number. It was to his brother. <laughs> But everybody knows knows everybody. So right. I call them, get me in the right place. I'm talking to them, <laughs> and they give me an opportunity to come down and preach. Right. And this place was an hour, 45, two hours away from me. I'm in seminary. I ain't got no money. I'm thinking this is an opportunity to go preach because the prison. I love preaching there. We weren't getting paid. It was, you know, you had to kind of live. Right. So they invite me to come. I'm young. I'm like 22, 22 at the time, and. I go down my little white robe, I done drove this thing, and it was a church that had been vacant for two years. And it might've been seven, eight people there, but I was just happy to have an opportunity to preach. I drove two hours to preach. And they gave me my little honorarium, mm -hmm. and then they took me to the biggest restaurant in the area, Cracker Barrel. Mm -hmm. And they invited me to come back the next week, the next month, and then the next month. But at that time, I was really making a, a plan. Uh, my first year seminary at Emory was difficult because I, didn't have a lot of finances. They covered all my stuff, but I had to live. It's Atlanta. So I was talking to my pastor at the time, and he was going to let me come do um, the summer camp for them. And then I was going to transfer to Howard to be on staff with him because I, I just couldn't live. And so they invited me to come one more time. I said, I, I just can't go. I got to, you know, I appreciate it. You know, they were pounding the preacher in the country. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like you was getting, you know, I was barely covering gas to go. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny. I'm getting ready to make the decision in August to go to Howard the next day. It's a Sunday night, go to Howard the next day to do the transfer. And I get a call that night, Sunday night. My pastor preached in Baltimore. I, at the time I lived in Virginia, so that's an hour and 20 some minute ride. And it's a, it's a 334 number. It's one of the leaders from the church. They called and say, hey, Reverend Goodman, this is so-and-so from Pleasant View Missionary Baptist Church. We want you to know we had a vote yesterday and we voted you to be our pastor. <laughs> A, I didn't know I was at a running. <laughs> and B, it's so funny when I hear the story now, it's crazy. Um, they had three other names of people that were passing before, but there was an old deacon, rest in peace. Um, and he stood up and said, hey, all I know is that little light-skinned fella from Atlanta comes. There's an the energy he brings. And maybe it's not what we want, but what God wants for us. And he put my name on the list. And after the vote, I became the pastor of the Pleasant View Missionary Baptist Church at 23 years old because I just had a birthday. Yeah, so that was my first pastor. So automatically life changed. I didn't go to Howard the next day. I kept going to Emory. And for three and a half years, God graced me to lead that amazing congregation in the country of Salem, Alabama. I mean, Salem. I have to always remind people, not Selma, Salem. It's, it's Salem. Uh, but man, it was great. God graced us in those years to grow exponentially. And I'm just trying out things. I'm just working. I mean, I'm going to seminary during the week and then they come down, they let me stay, put me up in the Holiday Inn and I just come and I practice. And I would just work and work and work. And, they, they, and, and God grew. People were coming from Montgomery, Birmingham, mm -hmm. um, Atlanta. It was just, just kind of crazy to do something different in the, in, the, in the country. And what's interesting is I was different as a preacher because most of the preachers there were more vocally blessed than me. When I first started preaching, the pastor who licensed or ordained me, Dr. Joseph Parks at Grace Baptist Church in Winston, I used to grow up singing. I used to play keyboard, organ, drums. He forbade me from singing when I started preaching because he said, I want you to be known as a preacher not just a singing preacher. So when I get to Alabama, you got to understand, it's the country. People got more vocal gifts. I mean, they can yodel. That's what they said, because they be yodeling. I mean, they sing before they preach. They preach a little bit, but they go yodel, and they would turn to church. But I, I didn't have that. So I'm strictly trying to work. Let me explain this to you. Let me do this. Let me. And so there in that moment, my style was getting developed. While I'm in seminary, I'm also in seminary at the same time. Here's some of the formative things is my preaching professors at this time, Dr. Teresa Fry Brown. Mm -hmm. I had a directed study with Dr. Tom Long. Wow. Also had a, a boot camp with Dr. Fred Craddock. Wow. Oh, yeah. And the one that I did with Dr. Tom Long, he wouldn't make me because we had a whole semester together. Bring a videotape of my weekly sermon to him and we would watch it together hmm. every week. Hmm. You talk about nerve wracking. Hmm. At that time, we weren't no streaming. We just literally had a VHS set up in the church and they would record it. And I would have to sit there that week and he would just be sitting there and we'd just go over it. And I'd be like, man, this, I don't know how I feel about this, but I was giving my best, getting real time critique and really had the desire, Dr. Thomas, to just be better. 
And so that country just allowed me, that church, uh, amazing people, just allowed me to practice on them week after week. Because I know there are many times they, <laughs> bless their heart, they got, they got, I mean, it was awful. Uh, <laughs> but Dr. G, uh, um, Dr. Kenny from Virginia Union gives a story and, and, uh, and echo what uh, Dr. Brad Brax used to tell me. Sometimes you're going to put, you're going to feed them filet mignon on fine china. Other times you're going to give them burnt hot dogs on paper plates. Just feed the people. And that was a freeing thing because then in the country, no one knew who I was. I'm really just working and working and working. So that's where there. So I was there three and a half years. And then in 2006, I was at Hampton coming back, coming back from Hampton. A good friend of mine, Dr. Terrence Gaddis, who was a classmate of mine at Candler, but also just started passing at McDonough. We're sitting at the gate getting ready to move from Hampton. I'm getting ready to come home. And guess who strolls up? Dr. Martha Simmons. Mm -hmm. She had missed the flight, so now she was on our flight. And so we sitting there, and she, you know, as Doc, Doc always does, she looked at me and said, Goodman, have you thought about Tabernacle Baptist Church in Augusta? I said, I said, Doc, I'm 26, I'm single. I'm 26, I'm single. She said, send me your resume. Because mm -hmm. you know, sometimes Doc be getting real spooky over you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Like I get random calls even to this day or text. How are you? I'm praying for you. Just, just random. So, so um, I sent him my resume. And at this time, I'm really just locked in at my church. Mm -hmm. I went to a church. I grew up in a church that never got over 50 people. Church I got licensed and ordained with never got over 50 people. So in my mind, this is church, right? My first foray into mega church was when I was with my pastor, Anthony Macklin in, in, in DC, Maryland. I mean, they were up to three, four, five thousand, but I'm like, okay, that's, that's that, I'm, you know. I'm, so me being in the country and we grew to almost 300 mm -hmm. in the country, mm -hmm. I got a good church. They take care, I mean, they done gave me a nice little insurance. I mean, they paid me well, I'm fine. Right. <laughs> Give me a little gas call, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm living life, I am great. And I sent her my resume. Mm -hmm. That was the summer of uh, I was 26, so that was the summer of 2003. Uh, no, that was 2006, mm -hmm. center that summer. And I got a call from them in July. Mm -hmm. I don't know what she did to that resume, mm -hmm. but it got me enough to get in. Mm -hmm. And I had an interview in July and they asked me to come preach in October. There was three candidates, whittled us down to two at the two votes and man, December 31st, I started at Tabernacle Baptist Church as the 10th pastor in the history of this church. And it, that was 2006 going into 2007. So I've been there the last 16, 17 years, and it has been an incredible journey with some amazing people mm -hmm. who just like I did in Pleasant View, they let me practice every single week. So I, you know, it's been, it's been a great, great, great time. Wow, wow, wow. It's been, that's an amazing story uh, from so many different angles. So just now, let's come back to the ALS. Mm. Let, you know, let's go back yeah. to it. It was an early diagnosis, mm -hmm. so tell me about that. We want to weave that into yeah. that. Yeah, my senior year of college, you know, I was, I was planning to go to law school. I mean, everything had lined up that way. We've done the LSAT, all these things. And so that beginning semester, that fall semester of my senior year, I was developing some weakness in my hand. I thought it was carpal tunnel. I'm like, oh, nothing, you know. Let me figure it out, go get some tests, whatever. Maybe I'd get some whatever. And man, so I actually went home that summer, that, that winter, and my sports medicine doctor from my high school, I just went by and he knows something. He said, I, you seem like you're favoring your hand. I said, yeah, it's just a little weak. He said, let me send you to this doctor. Let's, let's just get you checked out. And so January of that year, after a couple tests and things, I went to a couple doctors. January 22nd, 2001. I'm in my last semester of school. And I'm sitting there with my mom and my grandfather there. The doctor comes in and says, well, we've done every, exhausted all the tests we can. This is, our only conclusion is that you have ALS. And in our opinion. So tell me, because we have an international yeah. audience, a lot of people. That yeah, it's called Lou Gehrig's disease. I mean, uh, the, the, the longer term for it is, it's a disease that affects your muscles and your nerves. They stop communicating. It starts with weaknesses in your limbs and then eventually it just takes over your body. Your mind, crazy thing is almost like what makes it so horrific is that your mind is still sharp. You mm -hmm. just can't function. And so literally they told me that January 22nd, 2001, in our opinion, you only have two years to live. Mm -hmm. 
And I am like, what in the world's going on? Mm. My grandfather, strongest man I know, first time I seen him cry, mm. mom crying. I'm like, I don't, I'm trying to go to law school. Mm. Um, last semester of school, what in the world? Mm. I never get that night, and what makes that critical, I went home, you know, family, friends were starting to leak out. You know, it's just, it's just a time. So I'm from Greensboro, but I went to school in Winston. So Wake Forest is in Winston. And I said, I just can't be here tonight. So I wanted to drive home. I wanted to drive back to school. Just let me get by myself. On the way back to school, it was late. It was like two, three o'clock in the morning. I called my pastor and he said, just meet me in Kernersville at McDonald's. So we get to McDonald's and he looks at me. He said, he said I don't think God is through with you. I have to really think this is God trying to get your attention. Mm -hmm. He said, I want you to pray about this. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there like, I just heard the most devastating news mm -hmm. of my life earlier that day. Mm -hmm. And now my pastor saying, I think this guy tried to get your attention. So while I'm driving from Kernerville to Winston, I'm like, hold on, God. There's got to be greater ways to get my attention, <laughs> <laughs> better ways than this. Right. But I got in my room that night, Doc, and this is what I said. And literally the thing that gave me peace and really has been the motivation and passion for me ever since. As I said, God, if it's just two years, I give you these two. I give you all I got. Mm -hmm. yep. So if this is what it means, if this is what I've been running, okay. I ain't running no more. What I need to do, if it's just two years, I give it to you. Mm -hmm. And from that critical moment of that night till now, I really feel that's the thing that kind of pushes me as passionate as hard as I go in ministry and preaching and pastoring is because I'm still living on that promise that night. And so from there, I began to be serious about ministry. I got licensed in April of that year. Um, stopped going, um, school's over, law school's out of my mind. Let me try to figure out school stuff. I don't know, what, I'm gonna give it to you guys. Whatever it is, if I don't make it through, fine. I'm just gonna go hard. And so that's why when people see what I do and how I do it, this is not a calling for me. I really feel like my life is tied to it from that one promise and pledge I made, I feel like God has kept me way beyond what doctors said as a way to say, all right, this is, it's the fuel for my life. So, so there is nothing I do even now that that does not yet still push, you know? And so people see like, man, you, you know, all this education, as much as you go, it's like, no, I got a, I got a promise that I always got to keep. Every day I wake up, I've got to keep this promise that I made to God. Over to now is what, 22 years ago. Yeah. Mm. So how are you managing now with it? How it's been? You know, it's interesting. And I'm gonna tell you how God sovereignly sets things up because at the time, unbeknownst to me, the number one ALS doctor in the world was at Wake Forest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because of my connection with our president, Dr. Angelo, what should have been a two year wait, they were able to get me in to see him in two weeks. Mm -hmm. They had experimental drugs, but if anybody knows anything about ALS, it is not supposed to be curable. But where I found myself is they gave me experimental uh, medicine. But after a while, God just kind of ceased it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's only really now confined to one part of my body, typically supposed to spread. But as now, it's just unless you know, you don't know. I've kind of learned how to navigate it. Mm -hmm. It really affects my right side a lot more. Um, and so I just had to make some adjustments. But that's why I, my regimen of diet in the gym all the time. You know, I really try to do things to make sure that I keep myself as healthy as possible. But I believe God healed me and I believe that I'm living that miraculous part that God has kind of did in my life as a response to that call. I think this is a profound moment in the interview and I thank you for being willing to discuss it because I don't think that the church knows what to do with chronic illness. Mm. I think we're trying to heal it mm. um, quickly. Mm -hmm and some of these things we have to learn to live. So I have a phrase, I, you can't steal this, but um, the phrase, and I, I'm trying to work it into something, but you know, I, I learned it when my dad died. Mm -hmm. God, I know that you're a healer. I just wanna be able to accept whatever form the healing, mm -hmm. the healing comes. Absolutely. It may not come, see, I think we got one form yeah, yeah. In, yeah. in the church. Yeah. Total deliverance, yeah. we're gonna anoint you yeah. with oil, we're gonna yeah. get the elders, we're yeah. gonna pray, and you know, you're not gonna have this thing. Yeah. But for a, a lot of folks, it's like the healing comes by the ability. It's like it's almost, and I'm gonna go back to you because you know, it's not really about me. 
You know, there's a difference between a cure, we're looking for a cure, a difference between a cure and a healing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't get, I didn't get the strength back in my hand. I just got sustained, mm -hmm. right? Like I didn't, I don't have it back. I still have trouble with dexterity on my right side. You know, I try to hide it. You know, even now I was just talking to staff. You know, I've had the last few weeks or so, I've been really having a, a thing about holding the mic. It's been a struggle. I didn't get my strength back. Right. I just got sustained. Right. But then on the other side, the most important person in the world to me, my grandfather, gets sick with cancer and he dies in 08. Mm -hmm. So here I'm on one side where I'm experienced the sustaining, miraculous power of God that I'm still here. And then on the other side, the most important person to me in my life gets healed on the other side. And I wrestle with that dichotomy. And I still to this day, you know, where I'm trying to preach hope in there's times where, yes, I've seen God do it for me, but I also got to acknowledge that there have been moments where it hadn't worked out how I wanted it. Right, right. And that's, that's a tension that I have to continue to chisel through in my own theology, chisel through in my own presentation of things, because even in this, when my grandfather died, it changed how I approach funerals and preaching at funerals. Right. Right. Because it's a whole different ball game when you're the one on the front row. That's right. <laughs> and uh, and what I say in those moments to comfort people and still tell them that God is good, even when it doesn't work out how we want it to work out. Right. You know, right. and um, that's things that I still to this day have to really grapple with. And that hard portion of God, um, you know, it's tough. It is. It's tough. It's it's the real struggle. Mm -hmm you know, that many people have, that many, many, many people. And I, I go back again, I, with my father's death, the only way I resolved it, and in my own, you know, I'm, I'm older and you get, you get health challenges, you get older. It's God, I'm available to any form. You, you are a healer. Yes. And I don't want to be stuck on what I think the form Absolutely. of the healing is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we're able to take these things and turn them into victories mm -hmm. because you know, I don't need to be cured. I just want to be healed. Mm. And healing seems to be, I'm able to manage, work this into the flow of my life and still get done what I need to get done. I have, to have to, issues to manage. But, you know, back to you. So thank you for that, because that's a profound message I think that people need to hear. And I, you know, I'm, I always think about, right, I, I would like to see you write something about um, chronic illness in the mm. black church. Mm. Because... Yeah. It's not much out there. Yeah, we got one thing. Mm -hmm. We anoint you with oil. Yes, it. And then, you know, so let's go back to preaching. So how do you prepare a sermon? That is such a deep <laughs> thought. It's, well, first of all, I have not written a sermon. So I wish I could write a manuscript. Part of my challenge at the ALS, it hindered my dexterity and my right side. So from my senior year of college to even now, it was a struggle to write, to type. So I had to learn to lean in on a gift God gave me a long time ago, but I never knew how profound it was. I have um, photographic memory. Mm -hmm. So for me, I literally have, I've never written a full sermon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have the thoughts and the placements of them in my mind. Yeah. That's been honed through the years, right. right? I think I always tell people the way to get better at preaching is preaching. Mm -hmm. So it developed because early on, I'm still trying to figure out what it looks like. You know, when I first started preaching, initially I, I'm licensing at 21, ordained at 22. By 23, I'm already pastoring. So really, honestly, my formalized portion of preaching was in a short time. And now I got to prepare every week. And I got seminary mm -hmm. that they want their papers. Right. <laughs> so I'm having to figure out how to develop this thing. So it's morphed, whether it was my initial idea of the text, creating um, a little outline. But I've always been a student of scripture, historical criticism. When you expose the things, you begin to intertwine it. So for me, the question has been that that moment has moved. It has it has grown. So if you'd asked me then, it was just trying to figure out how to get a good word every week. Mm -hmm. Now, I do a lot of my preaching within the context of series, which helps me to get some things prepared before. So for me, sermon prep actually beyond the larger macro happens every Sunday night, because once that sermon is preached, mm -hmm. Sundays keep on coming. That's right. 
So it begins in just at least that formulation of my thoughts. So there's certain things because of who I've been interacting with throughout the years from uh, Dr. Bill Curtis really challenged me about tension. Mm -hmm. What's the tension of a text? Mm -hmm. Or Dr. John Guns, who really challenged me on raising relevant questions, mm -hmm. right? Or even uh, Dr. Fred Haynes and Dr. Um, uh, Johnson out of Indy, who really challenged me on illustrations. Jeffrey Johnson. Yes. Mm -hmm. And structure-wise, uh, Dr. Maurice Watson and Pastor Arthur Jackson. Mm -hmm. Or even just the language of a Dr. Gina Stewart. Mm -hmm. So everyone that I'm kind of growing with, every time I'm going, I'm adding a piece of their, their mind and what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm engaged with. So for me, it's really finding the text, beginning with that initial thought, what is this text saying? Mm -hmm. And I have a structure that I have in my mind, whether it's the opening statement, whether it's the exegetical thought, which is the simple theme of this passage. What's the tension? Mm -hmm. When I say tension, what the theme of the passage versus where it is intense tension with our contemporary life, then what's the central theme, mm -hmm. relevant question. And from there, I try to build my principles. Mm -hmm. Early on, I used to force alliteration. I think all young preachers, we just hear the rhyming of sermons. And so that's something easy and it's portable because remember, I'm not writing anything down. So I need something that I can quickly get. Even now, I don't I'm not as drawn to that, but I am drawn to knowing the principles on my roadmap. Right. Whatever is built from that text answers that relevant question is the way I kind of flow with it. But I, I've always had to hone that. And once again, that's looking at close to 20 some years of developing this, this extemporaneous non-manuscript kind of, of outline um, procedure that I do. And that's why I always love my, I love the Apple, the iPhone, because it has the notes app. I'm always putting stuff in. There's stuff I'm writing that, oh man, this thought came to me, this goes here. Or I have an illustration note that whenever I get an illustration, just put it in there. And it's gonna be, at some point I'm gonna utilize it. At some point I'm gonna do something. So it's always building. It's always building, it's always building. It's interesting, especially in this compelling preaching initiative, you've been really challenging us to think through some things. And two of the options I thought about was either writing on PG's playbook about how I plan preaching or PG's cookbook, how I do my preaching because to me I view it as a gumbo PG yeah PG well Pastor Goodman that's what people call me so so um this gumbo of 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 my style that I grew up with I hear my grandmother I hear all these people that I bring to the desk with me that is really in my ear in my spirit that's also helping me to craft to also sharpen my own voice so how has hip-hop influenced either your sermon preparation your delivery and that's in the that's in the gumbo as well mm -hmm. yeah so flow steady tension adding co contemporary colloquialisms that people can resonate with mm -hmm. you know um being witty being spurred a moment you know i think it's almost that that piece of what they would call in hip-hop the cypher mm -hmm. right because mm -hmm. even though now we're at our, our church i do multiple services every sunday which is like four now we're getting ready to go back to our fifth but Every sermon is different because I'm not writing them. Mm -hmm. So the way I approach them, how I preach it at my early service is not how I preached at my last one. Right. It's been honed. I done preached it. I know what works. I know what doesn't work. Also, I got lesser time. I got more time or lesser time. So I got to know how I flow with it. So for me, it helps me to just kind of get the vibe. And also for me, preaching is always, and this is what I'm so grateful for. Now we got people back in the room because it was never meant to be a monologue. It was always a dialogue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so just like with hip hop, you're feeling the crowd. Mm -hmm. Are they getting this? Mm -hmm. Are they not getting this? Mm -hmm. What else I need to say? Let me come another way. Mm -hmm. Even stuff that you're not even planning, that's the spirit in the moment that is able to drop you things. Because once again, I'm not offering to God an empty vessel. Right. I read widely, I study, which means that even stuff that I didn't prepare to say, I'm prepared to say. Right. Because in that moment, you just never know what comes out. And, you know, there's an element of oral composition, too. Mm -hmm. there, there's a, in, in all these strands you're talking about uh, that, you know, the, the we, we create in the moment. And I don't mean unprepared. Mm -hmm. I think you, you, it's very clear you're prepared. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's an element of, or, of com just oral composition. Mm -hmm. I think an element of jazz, if we, yep. you know, we're thinking that way. 
Now, tell me a time that you thought and felt and believed that God really used you mm -hmm. in your preaching. What, what, would be, what would be a time that it just was everything you'd ever thought it would be and you knew it was God, so mm -hmm. tell me, tell me. Wow, that's a great question. Well, it definitely wasn't because the sermon was great. Mm -hmm. You know, I will, I will admit and acknowledge that one, some of my most effective sermons was when I thought I was really awful. Mm -hmm. right. And I was like, what is happening? No yeah. one's saying anything. Right. And I really went through a like crisis, like they're not hearing anything. But it's only until afterwards that people come up to you and say, man, that sermon really blessed me. Right. And you're like, what? Mm -hmm. And I know in my mind, I was bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> what you left out. What I was bad. Right. And that's also reiterated to me the power of the Holy Spirit in preaching. Because mm -hmm. I've had moments, Doc, where people come up to me and said something I said blessed them in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I know I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> Which also affirms to me that preaching, just like communication, is not just what you say, it's what they hear. Mm -hmm. right. So that is what I'm astounded with. Right. is those stories of, not when everybody runs, jumps and shout. I mean, as a preacher, I mean, we like that. We, you know, the, the black experience in the, in, the, in the church moment is just crazy, right? You want them to shout, you killed the house, doc. Right. But man, it's those moments when there is not a chirp in that room. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying, because I'm gonna give God my best. I'm gonna prepare. Right. Sometimes it just doesn't go the way you picture it. But then afterwards, man, people are like, you know, that really blessed me. Or I had to make a decision and you helped me. Or uh, a, a few months ago, somebody came and said, man, I was battling with this and I really thought that my life was ending and I heard this sermon you preached. Mm -hmm. Or even now, stuff that people go back to hear. Thank God for technology. Mm -hmm. Somebody recently sent me something from a sermon I preached in 2011 mm -hmm. right. that somehow just showed up in this thing. And they said, listen, I heard that today. And it did something for me. And I was like, God, that's just the timeless nature of it. Because we never know when we put it out. We're thinking it's real time. We're assuming that this is it. This is the only time it. And now people are engaging it at different moments of their experience in their life. And I just, that to me is one of it. So I'm still waiting for that one. Oh, well, you know, the lights and the, the, the sky gets open. Um, but if not, it's the moments when people will come up and say, listen, that really, that really changed me, helped my mind. Let's go to the other side of the house. Give me a time when it was it was the most difficult to mm. preach that family situation, personal mm. church. When that, when was it a time that it was the most difficult for you to preach? Last year, I preached a series in May on grief. Mm. And that was the hardest series I probably ever preached in my life. Tell me because it made me look at my own ways that I have not dealt with my own grief. When my grandfather died in 08, my grandfather died in 08. I got the word I was in Phoenix, mm. flew back early. My grandmother was not going to do anything with the body until I got there. Right. So I had to be there to make sure it was cool. We ended up doing a funeral on Saturday. I don't have many regrets, Doc. I really don't in my life. But this is one. I did his funeral on Saturday and I came back and preached at my church on Sunday. And I thought Pastor Goodman was fine, but what I did not take into account is the heaviness of little Charlie, mm -hmm. who was the grandson, mm -hmm. who was the baby boy that didn't get to grieve. Mm -hmm. And because Pastor Goodman is a grinder, mm -hmm. I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Life is good. <laughs> God is able. He'll sustain you. And it took almost those 14 years to realize I wasn't healed. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm, I'm doing a series on grief and because we're focused on May as our family mental health month at our church and that I could not, I'm telling you, I don't think I made it through any of those sermons without crying. Mm -hmm. Even now my soul, I'm, I feel the heaviness of it. So that was the hardest thing because I didn't want to be that vulnerable. As preachers, I know we say it. I know we go out there, we transparent, we try, but that is hard because we gotta, we're God's ambassadors. We gotta, we do this, God, God's with us. We, we be with God. Most people think we just hang out with God all week. They just show up on Sunday. 
But man, it is hard. It was the hardest thing being that vulnerable and acknowledging in that season. And I had to make this declaration to my congregation. I apologize to them because I was a poor example to y'all. You saw me working and I thought that I needed to work to show you that you can push your way through everything. And I was wrong. I shouldn't have did that for you. And so now I want to apologize and share in this moment that it's okay to cry. It's okay to pause. It's okay to have a bad day. And that was the real practical moments in those preaching. Like, it's okay. You know, weeping may endure for a night. We don't know how long the night is going to be. Night is not just a 12 hour span. Night could be a month, two years. But what I am sure of is joy is gonna meet you on the other side of that night. And we gotta be, be we're gonna get there eventually. And so I think that to me was the moment. So what, what would you now and your older self tell your younger self? I think you just told me, but just, or, or you know, you also are telling younger preachers, you know, what, so what would your, older self tell to your young, say about that to your younger self. Mm. I would tell my younger self, you don't have to win everything today. Mm. It's okay that there's some stuff that you don't get done today. Mm -hmm. I also tell my younger self and even young preachers that I have an opportunity to mentor now, um, enjoy seasons of being anonymous. I, I didn't know it at the time, because I was really just grinding, but I miss those seasons of being in that country. Mm. Nobody knows your names. I could go to church at revivals and not be asked to come to the pulpit, mm. just sit in the back and get fed. I miss, I wish I would have took more advantage of those seasons because then I could really continue to just have time for me. Mm. I also would tell my younger self, don't just read the Bible to go get a sermon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That I think that it's so crucial. And this is something, Doc, that I'm really trying to embrace and lean into now. That I think in order for us to be better preachers, we need to be better disciples. Mm -hmm. And what has been more formative in my preaching is the fact that when I go to that Bible, when I read, I'm not just looking for a sermon. I'm really trying to grow. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it has made me a better preacher because I really want to be a better disciple. Mm -hmm. And I would tell them, I think that is so critical. Don't be in performance mode all the time. Right. You know, right. just give your best and let God do the rest. And so, you know, that's most of the things I, I, I try to impart, impart. And if I was to tell Lil Goodman, yeah, man, it's okay. This mm -hmm. journey, mm -hmm. I know you at this moment, I know Lil Goodman, you thinking time is, is, is coming on you fast. And I know, cause that was my approach. That's why I think God did such a fast thing, because I really lived life like I only had two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would love to tell Goodman, it's OK, you're going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe some things that I forsake, whether it was relationships, whether it was this, whether it was that. It's OK. Mm -hmm. You're going to make it. Right. Yeah. So that's what I probably would tell myself. So could, how would you name your preaching style? We've been kind of talking if you had yeah. to name it. Wow, that is so incredible. You know, y'all challenged us last time we gathered, how we view God, yeah, in Compelling Preaching Initiative, um, to how we view God. And man, when you, when that finally dawned on me that out of everything I view God as loving, that began to really put things in perspective. And as I heard the rest of the people who I'm so enamored with in our group uh, share their thoughts, none of us had the same thing. <laughs> And I was like, that is so interesting and dope and like at the same time. So it got me thinking that if I was to kind of form it, um, I would say I'm more of a narrative life situational expositor. What does that mean? Now I'm just coming up with my own terms. Right, yeah, this that, is which is what we like. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. The narrative yeah. is God's story. Right. And how it intersects with your story, life situation, your story and your situation right. through the lens of a of a text or scripture. Mm -hmm. If I was to put me, that, that's me. I'm a narrative life situational expositor. <laughs> so <laughs> it's always gonna be here with God's story and how it invades in our own story through our situations and how that then can be examined through a particular text in a particular context. Right. 
So that's where I'm at right now. Now, if you would ask me this question next year, uh, it may change. But that's why I've been really thinking, because I really have been trying to figure out how do I do what I do? And why does it resonate? So then the method to get there is, you know, you had an order, remember? Mm -hmm. Relevant question was way down. Yes, uh -huh. So go, go back over that order for me, because mm -hmm. that's the method to get mm -hmm. to. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that exegetical thought, and it's just in my mind, mm -hmm. tension, central thing, relevant question, principles. Right, right. And, I, you know, I pushed that because one of the, one of the weaknesses in the African-American community is method. Mm. And we hear great preaching, we love great preaching, and a lot of us do great preaching, mm -hmm. but we can't name our method, okay. right? So which means that for all the people who love your preaching and all the people who are imitating your preaching, mm -hmm. if they don't have a sense of your method, That's true. then they sound like you, or they dress like you, mm -hmm. or they clothes like you. Mm -hmm. We have no idea of what you're doing. Yeah. So part of why we do this series is to help people from the method side yeah. by hearing take great preachers and talk about method. And also to push on you all to articulate because my argument is a preacher needs to leave a recipe mm -hmm. so that the next generation can look at it, can take it, and can change it or adjust it to their own thing, but they've got a recipe. It's like, you know, how, if, if, mama, if grandmama make biscuits like nobody on earth and grandmama don't leave a recipe, mm -hmm. then everybody is trying to figure it out. And so some of my contribution is to ask method questions. So, you know, and it's part of the com compelling preaching mm -hmm. issue. So I, I'd love to see you flesh that out. Yeah. You know, you got the, you've got the bones mm -hmm. of it, just kind of flesh it out and you leave something behind at a whole nother level. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and as young preachers, they wanna know, how do you do what you do? Mm -hmm. And you can tell them. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. narrative, yeah, this life is situation, mm -hmm. expository. Mm -hmm. This is how I prepare the sermon. This is where I start with. These are the questions and it helps them yeah. because I really think um, without method, preaching is weak or, um, you know, with method, it cuts sermon preparation down. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you're not scrambling every week. Mm -hmm. When you don't have method or at least clear method, your sermons do this, you're good one week and you're down, mm -hmm. you know, and then, but it adds a consistency and a trajectory when you can start to name this stuff, which is why so many uh, wonderful preachers um, will take our PhD program, our compelling preaching initiative, and we push them on method, and they go to another level. Yeah. Because yeah. You, you get intentional. You, yeah. You, yeah. Once you name it, you yeah. get it. I know this is far upfield, so we're talking about you. But no, but it's good. I think, and, and to those who are, are viewing, I, I agree. I, that's one thing that's challenging me. Because, hey, I had to finally realize people are watching what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you can be so in it that you don't think about it, because you're just so, I'm just trying to get better every week. Right. I mean, it's really even now to this day, I'm still evaluating, well, what I did this past weekend, and I got another weekend to get it together. So I'm still at the place where, man, I'm just trying to get better every week. And so it is astounding that people want to hear you, number one, mm -hmm. and then number two, emulate what you do. Exactly. And uh, that's still mind-blowing, but that's, yeah, that's the process. Yeah, that's the process. That's the process. Well, I think you're coming along, you know, nicely in it. I think that you'll be able to um, to maybe teach preaching one day. I don't know, you know, if that I did not know that I would ever be teaching preaching. Henry Mitchell called it out of me. Mm. You know, I was just a pastor trying to get better on yeah. a on a weekly basis. That's yeah. all I was trying to do, and he he just yanked it out of me. You wow. can you 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 can do this, and mm. so it has opened up into all of this stuff. Wow. So I, 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 you know, I, I think that you have these gifts. You will have many doors upon which to choose how God can best use you. And I hope that given the, the level of craft attention you've given to preaching mm -hmm. and given the years of experience that, which is part of what we're trying to do in the compelling, trying to help you focus down into yeah. a writing contribution, mm -hmm. you know, something, leaving something in writing or even if, you know, and then we talked about working through some of the ways by which you you can dictate it or you present the lecture and then you get 
you know, the transcription of the, of the lesson and you edit the transcription, you can do that audibly. Mm -hmm. You know, once you get an artifact mm -hmm. in sound, you can, you can come back and do whatever you want. Yeah. You know, come back there many ways. So I just, you know, I'm thankful, you know, for the time with you that you've been open and vulnerable. And I think that, um, I think you, we, you're offering um, an authentic masculinity in, a, in terms of that uh, sharing power, vulnerability. These are the things that make for me a, a you know, I, I was reading a woman named Susan Faldi and she mm -hmm. says, um, men, this I'm paraphrasing her, men um, don't need to learn how to be masculine. They, learn how, they need to learn how to be human and the masculinity will take care of mm -hmm. itself, you know. That's good. So thank you for modeling to my audience. Thank you for what you bring. Um, it's a lot of food for thought here. I can't wait to see what the discussion around this, you know, becomes. And to just bless you and encourage you and thank you and just keep doing it, man. It's a privilege for us to have you. And uh, I just can't wait to see what God finishes with you in terms of, you know, that it takes time to build a life you know, and I don't necessarily mean to testify, but I had, I'm in some places I had no idea I'd ever be. I never dreamed a PhD program until mm -hmm. and at the intersection of pastoring and, and the academic life. A PhD hit 31 years of pastoring, boom, and this, this, mm -hmm. this thing, you know, and so let me stop. I, I like to focus on the people, not focus on me. Anything that you want to say or ask that I didn't ask or anything that, that's in you that you would like? We have a national audience, international audience. People watch these things. It's amazing to me how much they watch them. Anything you want to say um, that I didn't think to ask or anything, just whatever you like to say. It's just amazing to, to be a part of this amazing tradition of African-American preaching. Mm -hmm. And to just be as faithful and steward well this portion of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like I, I've gleaned from so many before me, mm -hmm. um, it does up the ante that I owe it to those coming behind me. Because right. there's some mm -hmm. brilliant women and men that are just grabbing that plow firmly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and plowing uh, that gospel plow. So I think it's incredible. I think we owe it to those before us mm -hmm. to pay it forward. And I can't wait to see what it looks like. I still believe revival's hitting the church. And I still believe that a lot of it will happen through the gifted women and men of our African-American preaching tradition. Cause man, there's nothing like it. Nothing like it. The beauty, the depth, the power, the imagination, the creati creativity of the African-American preaching tradition mm -hmm. can generate a preaching renaissance to revive American Christianity Absolutely. and the 21st century. That's, that's the mantra for so much of my work that motivates me because yeah. um, it's a great tradition. Yeah. It's a great and yeah. you know, I had the blessed opportunity to work with Martha Simmons on that anthology of African-American preaching and it took us 10 years to pull that thing together and one of the if not the chief lesson out of all of that was how great this tradition is mm -hmm. that we're, we're walking in a stream mm -hmm. and a lot of preachers I fear are unaware of the stream mm -hmm. but to get in the stream and to look both back and then to look ahead you know, which begins to be a mentoring role, which begins to, what, whatever, what are you leaving? What's, what's your method? Mm -hmm. How are you training people? You know, how are you helping preachers to get better? How, you know, that's the question. Mm -hmm. How do you, given all that God has blessed you with, yeah. help preachers to get better? Yeah. Yeah. So. I would like to say, to validate those who, wherever you're watching, your voice is necessary. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your voice, like, there's not one preacher. God didn't call just one preacher. So your voice is necessary. And that has been the most assuring thing for me is to get the validation from you, Dr. Thomas, and others who in my own way that are still evolving, still becoming what it's going to become, right? I'm not, in, I'm not at the pinnacle of being a preacher God wants me to, that I feel like God wants me to be. But to just know that at every season, every stage, 
where I was at that moment was good. <laughs> As my voice was evolving, you know, so I want to encourage everyone, your voice is necessary and uh, just keep working, keep grinding. Thank you, Thanks, sir. Man. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. This, this is going to help a whole lot of people. So thank you. <laughs>